Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, and yes, you're inside the Totally Awesome Workshop. Now, those of you who follow us on the Fishing Show will know it's not very good for fishing if Graham's in his workshop, is it? But I, just, I can't sit around doing nothing, guys. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a rod rack, which most of us have probably seen in tackle shops or at shows where they have them vertically, Fly fishing, you know, if you go fly fishing, you go to a lot of trout fishing, they already have the rack there. But listen, you can make those as well. They don't cost an arm and a leg. And what am I going to be using? Yes, a trusty pallet. Now, for those of you who've watched whoo, our totally awesome outdoors show and other ones that I've made stuff with pallet wood, you'll see we've got some huge numbers on things I've made in this humble garage, or as the Americans say, garage. This is a different one. This is certainly a pallet, but it's a hardwood pallet. It's very, very heavy. You can get them from industrial estates. Generally, the hardwood ones, I say, heavy items have been carried on them, might be machinery, uh, some form of ironwork, you know, that's why they're strong. But also, a lot of countries around the world, unfortunately, are just sawing the life out of all the forests. And I hear from so many people that they're using really good quality hardwood trees to make pallets. Now that has got to be incredibly stupid. I mean, they're gonna cut the trees down anyway. We know they're all gonna go. But just to use them for pallets, I won't even burn these on my log burner because I like hard wood. It's nice to get, it will last, it's durable. So, I'm gonna strip these down. I'm gonna be taking, not me, I'm not stripping me down. I'm stripping the pallet down. And then I'm gonna be making this little rack as near to the measurements of the main pallet struts as I can. Minimum cuts, maybe a few nails, few screws, few cuts, you'll see as it comes along. The first off, I'm gonna strip this right down, make sure you take the nails out. I'm not gonna sh you know, show anybody how to take a pallet apart. I use a crowbar, uh, a big club hammer, you know, and just work away at it slowly and you can even cut it to the size you want to save pulling all those nails out. Let's get these broken down and I'll show you the different sizes we're gonna be using. Right now, I've broken the pallets right down into the two basic components, which is the base support is really, really heavy, and the slats themselves. Okay, so now you can see, perhaps there, if I compare the two, you might be able to see one is totally dog legged, it's gone. That's twice I've done that. Just pick your straight ones out. All I'm going to do first off to make this rod wrap is I want to make the main A-frame. I'm going to make that out of the heaviest piece here I can find that's straight and use that as a centre piece at the top. And then I'm going to put two at the bottom because this is, well, I'll tell you what this is. Just so you get a rough idea. All pallets are different. Okay, it's about two and a half square. So it's not, so some one might be three by three. But that's two and a half. So that'll give you a rough idea. And look, it doesn't really matter. You can cut it to whatever you want. That's a standard three feet. So let's just make one to show you. And I'll cut three pieces of this in three foot lengths. So that gives me two at the bottom, heavy ones like this, like two at the bottom, one at the top. That's going to be an A-frame. And I'm going to join it with slats at the bottom. And then I'm going to screw the top on and cut the notches. And it gets really interesting after that. So first thing, I'm going to cut these into three foot lengths. And obviously that's going to be my main width. Straight slats I'm going to put three foot lengths of that as well. You can use a handsaw, but be aware, as I said earlier, it is hardwood. You might want a reciprocating saw, or you know, if you've got a, a nice um, chop saw, you could use that. But basically, let's get sawing. Remember, you saw it on the Tony Awesome Fishing Show. Oh.
Okay, got them all cut up now. This is what we're going to make. It's what I'm calling the A-frame. As you can see, one of the strongest, well, it is the geometric strongest design, I do believe, when I was in school and taught that anyway, is a triangle. So, if you can sort of imagine this, I've had to use two benches just to balance it. There's my two, two and a half by two and a half inch square bases, supports. There's my two side struts. Now this is going to come up, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to screw it in there, like that, okay? So that's going to be the top, and that really is about the right angle for sloping fishing rods into uh, this rod rack. So, glasses back on, I'm going to measure up down here. I want to support across the bottom here. I mean, I can move this roughly. It's 13 inches. Maybe I'll go to 12 inches because 13 is bad luck, isn't it? I might just bring those in a little bit, just like this. Makes no real difference. The 12 inches. Cut a strut across there. 12 inches, and the same at the other end. Fire some screws in, and that will give me my distance so I know I'm going to be straight at the top here. Let's get that done. There you can see what I mean about the double A-frame at each end. It's screwed in here, I've got double screws there. It's still held together here with my rubber bands, just to give me a, a basic uh, pattern. And this is obviously going to go in between the two. I'm going to screw those up, and then, well, basically, look, here's where they go. They're going to go level with that. And then I've got two plates on the top to go there. So a nice big, heavy, chunky piece of rod wreck that's not going to fall over in the wind. Well, it won't, because it's in the garage. Hard wood, you can tell, even with that drill. I'll go around the other side. And this way, make sure your screws don't touch, you know, when they go through. Watch your fingers. Goes without saying, sort of common sense stuff, but hey-ho. Common sense isn't always in abundance. And then I'm going to... Do the same the other end as well. Okay, now remember I said that the uh, the weightier parts of the timber, the squares, were just under three inches square and say two and a half, two and three quarters, whatever. If you, a little trick here, I do a totally awesome tip, is get that measurement there with your thumb, okay, and then I roll the rubber bands down here because it's still held together. They act as support and they're pulling tight like this so I can rest that piece of wood in there exactly down to the depth of those rubber bands and it should be pretty close. I haven't got to keep juggling trying to drill one hand and hold the other end as a support. It's just a little tip that you might be able to use and let's, let's face it, these are, these are three rubber bands as well left by the postman. I waste 
nothing. Okay, it's all robust now. I've marked a centre line here and right down the bottom end and I'm cutting a piece of this probably going to do it an inch or two underneath just as decoration really and I'm going to put a, like a spacer, call it a spacer there. That will be on the top and then the other two pieces if I just show you quickly roughly with a scrap of wood are going to come out either side like that. So by marking the centre line here either side I can see where to put the screws in for this piece, just line them up. Let's get those screws in, we'll put one in, put the centre piece in and then put the other edge in and that will keep that centre piece lined up, we won't need to screw that at all. Okay, centre pieces in, two flat boards either side which I'm going to cut notches in. Now you could use a jigsaw, cut the notch in and then you can have trouble because in the cross piece, you know, when you try and cut dead square, you normally have to drill the corners out. So I'm going to bypass that because that's a slot that the rods are going to rest in at the top end by using one of these. Now I don't know what they call them in different countries, and if I tightened it up, wouldn't it? Uh, I suppose a big one we used to call core drills. I use them for cutting holes for waste pipes, locks in doors, that sort of thing. They come in different sizes, and that's going to cut a semicircle out. So I'm only going to fire it in because it's got a centre drill there, like a locator drill, if you like. That actually buries, you can just see that, buries a few millimetres first just to hold it dead still. So I'm just going to go in there inside the wood here, otherwise it might kick off. So watch yourself with these powerful drills because these will bite hard and you'll get a kickback so be careful those of you with weak wrists i would say all right let's have a go i feel a new battery coming don't you all right try again and as they say the kentucky derby here we go Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not sure, I'm not really sorry that that's over. I've been feeding batteries into the cooler so much so I've had to go to the cooler drill to knock these holes out. So much for the power of a drill against really good hardwood. And this is hot, so beware of that. When you're working with hardwood, whole different level of friction. I'm just going to do one side here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's eight there on one side. Hey guys. That allows me to do the same on the other side, which I can't do at the moment. That's 16 fishing rods on one rack that's barely, well, three feet wide. Now, onto the base rack with this drill. Okay, that's the top cuts done. I could sand that down later. I want something to put the base of the rods in so that they rest in the bottom without just splaying out all over the place. I've got a piece of pallet wood. But I've been sneaky, I've made life easy for myself, and that's what you want to do, make it easy. I've cut it so it fits on the internal as these struts like that. So it would go right down like that, leave it, well, just, you could leave it flush if you wanted to the whole board, and just check it with something like, he says, stretching. Broom handle, yeah, that's fine, because the further you bring it out, the more it tilts back. I'm going to bring it out about a half inch, screw it in there, but you think, Okay, you've then got to cut those little holes for it. Hey, hang on guys, why not, as I've measured it, slide it up to the top like this, just do a circle here, and then that should duplicate exactly on the bottom, the same as you've got here. And of course, I can cut out there much easier, I feel, when I've got it right hard on the deck. We'll put another piece of wood underneath it so it doesn't mark the concrete, or we'll go through to Australia with it. Let's get that section done. But there you go, there's the holes all cut in that match up to the top. I just put it on that base there, whiz in the screws. We are almost ready for staining. 
Now I'm not going to do the other side because this is obviously the object of the exercise just to show you what to do. You could just duplicate it the other side. But I've left up here a little bit of overhang there. You ask yourself, why? Hmm. There's something else I can put in there. There you go, there's a cup hook at each end. What am I gonna hang on there, you ask yourself? Well, first off, guys, I think I'm ready to give this a quick coat of stain. Well, here we go, I'm staining up, finished all the staining there. I've got all the... Graham, who are you talking to? Who am I talking to? I'm talking to my friends on YouTube. I was making a film for them. Your tea's on the table going cold. Okay, okay, I'll be in shortly. I'll be in shortly, okay? I mean, what can you do? What can you do when you get that? Does Quentin Tarantino get that when he's making a film? Is he halfway through making a multi-million pound movie? And his wife or somebody or his girlfriend phones up, Quentin, your tea's on the table. Honestly. No, I won't be long there. I'm just doing a photo shoot with Jennifer Lopez. We're just doing a costume change. We're just helping her. Oh, I'm coming. I'll give up, honestly, I'll give up. Let me go and have my tea, and then I'll come back and I'll show you all the rods in this finished. Man alive. At least you know it's an honest program. Well, welcome back to part two. And just look at the tackle I've got lined up on my rod rack. There you can see all the notches, the rod blanks slot in there nicely. And down at the base here, there's the circular cutouts and all the rod butts slot in there beautifully. You can put in there, folks, fly rods. You can put in there beach rods. They all go through there. Ultralight spinning rods for drop shotting for perch. You can put carp rods. As long as they are, they still go in. And of course, uptiding rods, giant boat rods, they all go in there, as you can see. That is the rod rack finished and done. Well pleased with that. There's only one thing to do after this, and that is, yes, this is what those hooks were for. Jacket, hang your jackets up there. If you didn't want those, you could hook your landing net up there. What a way to go. That is luxury for me. And if you think they're gonna fall out, don't worry, two screws, the old rubber band around the front, just like that. Job done, and now, well, you can see, a few hours in an afternoon, totally free pallet wood. This is going to last years and years being hardwood. What's it cost? Nothing except a handful of screws, a little bit of brain straining, and some manual physical work. No problem for most people, I guess. I can get 16 fishing rods here, either side, I've only done one side as well. So after all that work and all that hassle from the trouble and strife, I've had my tea, there's only one thing to do. I think, let's have a beer. Cheers. Oh, Jennifer's okay to come out now, love. The wife's gone.